Now, let's talk about vaccines. I'm going to show you a chart. Um, many of the people who are concerned about vaccine safety point to the fact that in randomized control trials of vaccines, the control arm is not pure salt water. I think this is the point that RFK Jr. makes. It's not pure salt water. It's not just water or something totally inert. Um, it's got the adjuvant in it, the amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate sulfate. It's got something else added to it. And this is an example from the package leaflet of Gardasil, where it was a randomized control trial of Gardasil versus the AAHS control and a saline placebo. They actually had a third arm where some people, a few hundred people, got a pure saline placebo. And actually, it does lend credence to the argument that on the issues of safety, having something added to salt water obscures safety a little bit. So just look at pain. Mild to moderate pain post dose one was experienced by 62% of people who got Gardasil, 56% of people who just got the uh, AAHS control, and only 33% of people who got the saline placebo. So what does that mean? That means that since Gardasil is doing a little bit worse than the AAHS control, that the active, uh, immunologically active part of Gardasil is increasing the pain. Sure but also the control with something in it, with the amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate sulfite in it, is doing a little bit worse than saline, which actually shows that had you just given nothing or given saline, the pain would have been even less. So I think this is a point that some people have, which is fair, that if you want to know the short-term acute side effects of a vaccine very, very clearly, your control arm shouldn't be a solution with the amorphous aluminum in it that will just mask some of the side effects, it should be something totally inert, like a saline or water injection. So this is the point they wanna make, and I think we have to concede that point is true, with some caveats. Now, some people say that if it had all been a saline-controlled study, you would have been able to find the thing that they're very worried about, which is something like a link between the vaccine and perhaps something like autism. The problem with that, and then they say by using the aluminum hydroxyphosphate sulfate as the control arm, you mask the ability to detect an autism signal because the control arm is getting the thing that they're worried about is causing the autism, perhaps. This is the argument that they would make. Now, the problem with that argument is that let's just say everybody here who got a placebo, which is something like 3,800 people, all got the saline placebo. Well, now you have a study that's roughly, you know, 5,000 versus, let's say, 4,000 people. We can even make a 5,000 versus 5,000 people. Um, your ability to detect the autism signal, uh, it makes less sense here because this is a vaccine given to people who are a little bit older. But let's say you, you know, you took a childhood immunization vaccine. You just don't have a lot of power. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. You've got 5,000, 5,000. You just don't have a lot of power for a rare adverse event. Something could be a rare side effect and having a placebo-controlled regulatory study it's not going to find that. I mean, you need sample sizes in the hundreds of thousands, uh, maybe even the millions to detect really rare and important safety signals. So in my mind, if you want to say the short-term side effect profile of something is obscured by an active control arm in vaccine studies, sure, say that. That's fine. And if we had a saline arm, we would have a better understanding of pain and swelling and erythema, redness. Sure, I'm willing to concede that. But if you want to say that if we had a control arm of saline, we'd be able to find all these things you're concerned about, like autism, et cetera, uh, I'd say, well, you got a power problem there too. So you got two problems. So I don't think you're not going to get too far there. Uh, we're working on some paper where we're going to try to come up with a compromise here that's going to make everybody happy about vaccine safety, I think, because I do think that uh, there are many important points that RFK makes. Uh, and some of those points is that our system is not terrific at detecting rare safety signals as evident by VIT and evident by myocarditis. But this particular point, I'm not really persuaded by the saline. Sure, yeah, give everyone a control arm of saline. You can do that. Uh, the problem then becomes you just don't have the power to find those signals. So, okay. So back to the placebo control question. Knowing that not all drugs that receive regulatory approval are truly placebo controlled, knowing that the placebo, a true inert placebo, will give you a better safety profile but may subvert your questions of efficacy, as in the Fruquitinib example, we come back. This is a table created by a lawyer. I haven't uh, checked every single data point on this table, but uh, I think the thrust of the table strikes me as generally probably pretty accurate, which is that these randomized control trials of vaccine used a control group that didn't really get salt water. They got a different vaccine or had no control group, uh, in which case they say it's not truly placebo controlled except for the Gardasil example. Um, 
Look, I'm happy to concede that by having active active placebo in vaccine studies, you're going to mask some of the short-term safety signals. Um, the part that I'll have difficulty conceding is that you would detect rare longer-term safety concerns because I think you'll struggle with the power issue. I have a solution for it. We're going to manuscript. We're going to submit. It's going to solve it all for all of y'all. Okay, but I'm trying to explain, I think, the principles of placebo control. This is a good example where I see this lawyer has extracted, like, what is the placebo? And in FOIA documents, this is the placebo of this vaccine study was two mLs of sucrose, sodium citrate, sodium phosphate, and no greater than X milligrams of polysorbate 80, which is many of the ingredients in the actual vaccine. And so then the argument is that if any of those ingredients caused any sort of local site reaction or anything, that would be obscured. I think that argument is well taken. But can any of these ingredients, given a low dose, really cause long-term sequela? I'm generally skeptical of that claim, but, you know, they take it more seriously, and it's hard to refute it in the absence of a third arm, which is really salt water. Okay, the last topic. Now, when might active placebos actually be desirable and good, okay? Can it be flipped on its head? 